As I began with the opening welcome for our service this morning, and as well as the prayer, today, September 12th, we remember what happened 20 years and one day ago in our country. On September 11th, 2001, over 2,900 people perished. And with the subsequent aftermath, there were well over 25,000 people injured, many severely. And that also does not count those who were injured in their soul, in their mind, with the horrific, with what they saw. Shortly after 9-11, there were wars that followed. And in the 20 years following since 9-11, in all the wars combined, there have been over 800,000 documented deaths. And that's only the documented ones. The experts believe that it's well above that total. Among civilian casualties, the documented number is over 300,000. And again, that is only official numbers. The exact toll most likely is higher as well. And as I shared in the prayer that I opened with, you look back now in the last 20 years, and if you were to take a poll of Americans today, many Americans would probably say that they don't necessarily feel safer today, September 12, 2021, than they did 20 years ago. We don't know what the answer is, but one thing that we could venture to guess is probably it is safe to say that violence begets violence. Vengeance does not lead to healing, restoration, and closure. It's quite fitting that we're going through the book of Nehemiah because today I want to talk about prayer. And actually, before we go any further into the scriptures, I'd like for us to pray once again. And if you can, whether you are in person or online, I invite you, let us bow our heads together in a moment of prayer. God, we remember what happened 20 years ago in our country, the actions of those terrorists which eventually reverberated throughout the world, which spawned multiple wars, conflicts all across the planet, the untold number of people who have suffered and died, have been displaced, governments that have been toppled, the sheer amount of human resources, resources, energy that has been poured into this war on terror. And we find ourselves in a situation where only a few weeks ago we saw the evacuation of Afghanistan, the retaking of that country by the Taliban. And many of our, many in our country are left wondering, what was it all for? Why did we shed our blood? Many are grief-stricken. Many are confused. Many are angry and furious. Oh God, we come to you asking that you would bring wisdom, you would bring peace into troubled minds and hearts, especially if there are any of us gathered today, online and in person, who have dealt with the aftermath of 9-11, who have experienced the horrors of war, we ask God for your comfort and your peace to rest upon us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word of truth as we lay our hearts open bare before you this day. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Just as I began with a prayer, I asked this question to all of you, a general question. What prompts you to pray? Why do you pray? What are the occasions in which you find yourselves on your knees in prayer before our God? To go back into the book of Nehemiah, let's take a look at what Nehemiah prayed back in chapter 1. I want to share a few verses, and I want to read beginning in verse 5. Nehemiah prayed after that time of mourning and fasting and weeping. He prayed this, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Nehemiah goes on in verse 9. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, this being the promises of God, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. And Nehemiah prayed some more words, and then he concluded. It's important to note that in chapter 1 in Nehemiah's prayer, Nehemiah recounts the faithfulness of God to God's people. One of the things that Nehemiah prays is, it's almost like Nehemiah brings before God the scriptures and the promises of God. And that leads me to my first point. Why do we pray? We pray because we have received promise. In Nehemiah's case, Nehemiah received an, all the people of Israel. They had received this promise that even though they would be scattered and exiled all around the world, that if we turn our hearts back to the Lord, obey the commands, the precepts given by the Lord our God, that as scattered as we might be throughout all the earth, God would bring us back to the place that God has chosen for God's name to be honored. And so we see a transition occurring in Nehemiah chapter 1. He hears the bad news Jerusalem, its walls are in ruins, burnt down into rubble. He cries, he fasts, he mourns for a period of days. And then he gets up and he begins to pray, and his prayer begins with promise. God, remember when? Remember when? Uh, my, my son, Johan, is really good at that. He has an uncanny memory when it comes to promises that daddy makes. Sometimes when daddy's at, its, at his wit's end and he makes these promises as flippant as they may be. I'm just trying to get the little man to cooperate with me, eat his vegetables or behave himself in the supermarket. And I'll say something like, oh, just behave yourself and I'll let you watch TV when we get home. Right? And I don't remember that, but we come home and... Johan will tap me on the, on the leg and say, Daddy, remember at the market? You said, if I behave myself, I get to watch Octonauts. Octonauts being the latest cartoon that kids love these days. And I'm reaching into my memory banks going, did I say that? I, I don't, re okay. I, I'm just going to trust you, little man. Okay, I think I did. All right. Um, that real-life illustration is kind of what we see Nehemiah doing here, but the stakes are higher. Nehemiah is saying, God, I grew up learning your word. I grew up learning of the stories of Moses and the Exodus and you rescuing your people, my people, out of slavery into the promised land. I remember the stories being recounted of my people, my ancestors, being led through the wilderness and you being faithful to them, you providing water, food to eat, even manna from heaven. I remember all that. And this really leads me to my point on the importance of children's ministry, both children's ministry at church, but also the kind of children's ministry that we do at home. 
So parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles, my charge to all of us is this. Let us do our utmost to teach our children the ways of the Lord. Can I get an amen? Let us do our utmost. In fact, our DCE, uh, Miss Patty, she led our children to Sunday school a few moments ago. Let us do our utmost to strengthen and encourage her ministry as she blesses our keiki. Uh, some of you have already in the last few weeks come up to her and approached her and said, hey, is there anything that I can do? Anything you need? Maybe I can't be a teacher, but any resources, anything that I can provide. And I know that some of you at home watching online have done that as well. You've shot off emails to her. You've introduced yourself. And you said, anything you need, I want to help our next generation ministries. And to that, I affirm you and I thank you. That is what is needed at this hour. The book of Nehemiah does not recount Nehemiah's childhood, but like I imagined out loud for us a little bit er earlier, I really believe that Nehemiah, as he grew up exiled, he learned from his mom the stories of old. How else can we explain Nehemiah knowing the promises of God and quoting from God's own word from the, the book of Moses, the words of Moses himself saying, God, remember, you promised this to your people a long time ago, and now I'm bringing your promises back to you in my prayer. Nehemiah and his fellow exiles, they learned it through their version of children's ministry, Sunday school, their parents, their elders. And so, sisters and brothers of AUMC, may that same culture of passing on the faith to the next generation, may it be alive and well. May that be part of the rebuilding of what we do here at AUMC. My prayer is this. Later on, I'm going to give these, this announcement regarding Keiki Camp. Would you prayerfully consider giving of your time as a volunteer to Keiki Camp? Would you prayerfully consider giving of your resources? I think that there's going to be a list of things, a wish list that Miss Patty will ask of the congregation. It would be great if we had these resources to give to our keiki. Would you prayerfully consider giving of your resources so that our children would have a memorable keiki camp next month? After promise, there is this next word, and that is the word fulfillment. I like the word fulfillment more than merely an answer to prayer. There is a fulfillment to the prayer. Because in prayer, we walk in a relationship with the living God. And anytime you join your heart and your mind with God in prayer, something will happen. Something does happen. Something powerful happens. And what, that, what happens is what can best be described as fulfillment. Let me give you a few examples. In the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah, they were barren. They could not have children. And God promises Abraham in Genesis 12, you will be the father of many nations. Your descendants will be more numerous. Look up at the sky, Abraham. Look up. More numerous than the stars in the sky. So shall be your offspring. But they were barren. They had no children. And by the way, Abraham was 75 years old when Genesis 12 occurred. It would take another 25 years when Abraham was nearly 100 years of age when Abraham and Sarah would receive their promised son, Isaac. 25 years between promise and fulfillment. The Jews living in exile in Babylon and later on pushed into the Persian Empire, the capital of Susa, in which we find the book of Nehemiah and Nehemiah himself. God promised, you will not always be exiled. You shall return to your land of Judah one day. Between that promise and the fulfillment, 70 years, almost a lifetime. Do you see what I'm getting at? 25 years, 70 years. 
Sometimes the fulfillment of our prayers does not come to fruition quickly. In fact, we could also say this, that the fulfillment of God's or our prayers to God often happens or always happens in God's timing and not our timing. And so on this topic of fulfillment, we cannot just fix our eyes on the answer to prayer, the fulfillment. That's, uh, that's, that will be wishful thinking. That will be just sitting around waiting and waiting until God answers. This past week, I read a very interesting article on the state of uh, the politicization of the coronavirus, especially here in our nation. And the article was written highlighting why so many evangelical Christians have been hesitant to receive the vaccine, any of the vaccines. And, you know, they would, they would interview, they would ask questions, they would take polls, but the consensus is this, that for many evangelical Christians, their, their logic is, their reasoning is, look, I'm prayerful, I'm waiting for God to offer a deliverance, I'm waiting for God to help turn the tide so that the pandemic would eventually dissipate, disappear, and that we would be victorious. We would no longer deal with masks, social distancing, limited indoor worship, you name it. To that, the article, the author, and it was more of an editorial now that I think about it, the author of this article said, well, that's interesting because has not God also provided us with the means through this vaccine? Is that not an answer to our prayers? But for many of the evangelical Christians, their focus is solely on this fulfillment, but perhaps to the detriment, being blinded to the fact that the promises have already arrived and there are solutions at our disposal. So that is a good lesson learned to say, let's not only focus on, let's not be so narrow-minded and focused on fulfillment. If we open our eyes, we might very well see that the fulfillment of our prayers could be right in front of us. The same is true with Nehemiah. If Nehemiah had only prayed this, oh God, the the hometown and the capital of my ancestors, of your dwelling place where the temple resides. It lies in ruins. The walls are in shambles. God, please do something. Amen. And then Nehemiah would sit on his hands and do nothing else. Well, that would be, definitely that would be Nehemiah just waiting for fulfillment to occur, but doing nothing about it. But we, we read through Nehemiah, we know what happens. As Nehemiah prays through and recounts God's promises, the Holy Spirit stirs within Nehemiah, hmm, I've chosen you. You are the one to go and help fulfill the promises of God and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So there's promise and there's fulfillment when it comes to our, the prayer life. In between the word that best can be described to describe this span, whether it's 25 years of Abraham and Sarah, 70 years of the Jews in exile, or whatever case, whatever situation we might be in today, whatever prayer that we're praying today, in between, the word that best describes that in-between stage is preparation. Preparation. There is a small detail that can easily be overlooked. In Nehemiah chapter 1, the book of Nehemiah begins by describing that it's late autumn, the month of Kislev, Nehemiah writes. Kislev, for us, is right now, September, October, November. And then we see in Nehemiah 2 what Doug read for us, early the following spring in the month of Nisan. And because we're not familiar with these month names, 
or these seasonal names, it could easily be overlooked, but Nisan is actually March and April. So we see October, November, March, April. That is a span of five to seven months. Five to seven months, and in between that time, what do you think happened? Preparation. A lot of prayers went into this. I highly doubt that Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 and following, the prayer that I read earlier, I highly doubt that that was the only prayer Nehemiah prayed in the five to seven months between Kislev, Kislev and Nisan. In fact, I would imagine Nehemiah daily on his knees in prayer, God, this is a tragedy. This cannot stand. Something must be done in Jerusalem. But in that time between promise and fulfillment, the preparation period, you could almost see that within Nehemiah's own heart, his heart began to turn back towards his people and back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and gates. I want to pause and ask you a question. Have you ever prayed for something and it felt like it took forever for fulfillment? I think a lot of us can relate. We pray and we pray and, oh, when, God, when? My encouragement to us is this, that as we find ourselves in that in-between promise and fulfillment space, that we recognize that preparation is taking place within our own lives, perhaps, that maybe even in our own hearts, God is beginning the work of preparation, getting our, our hearts and our minds ready for the fulfillment, the answer to God's prayers. And we must never forget this, and this is my final word, my final point, of what happens in prayer. Whenever God answers or fulfills a promise, it is always for a purpose. There's always a reason why God answers in the way God does. I shared last Sunday that God was doing something special through God's people, through the leadership of Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the wall. But then I said it, go, it went deeper than that. More than building a wall, God was restoring a people. The wall was simply an outward and visible sign of the inward state of the people's, of how they were. That broken down wall was a visible is a physical reminder of the condition of their hearts, that their faith and their relationship with God also had broken down and was in rubble. And so essentially the Lord God was saying to the broken people, come back into relationship with me. Come back and I will provide for you. I will protect you. God was saying to the people, I am faithful. I am loving and I am kind because I am your God. Our God is a God who restores the broken and mends the wounded. Amen? Our God is a God who revives the shattered dreams that we once had. Our God is a God who helps rebuild broken down relationships and brings healing and restoration and reconciliation where it is needed the most. There's always a reason and a purpose for the, for the things that God places on our hearts to pray. And so in closing... I ask again these questions. First, what in our life is in need of repair? What's broken in our life and in need of repair? It could be relationships. It could be habits. I was sharing with my staff a few weeks ago that uh, in my own life, uh, ever since the birth of the twins, which was over five years ago. But I used to be a morning person. I used to always be a morning person. I would get up before the sun. And, I would, uh, it, and it would energize me to wake up, to pray, or to exercise. Just read, do something in the morning. But once the twins came, my, my sleeping habits went out the window. I'd did not know what, what time of day it was. I was, uh, my wife and I were on sheer survival mode, right, with a two and a half year old and newborn twins to care for. Uh, we didn't know which way was up. And we, it's a miracle that all five of us are still alive right now. But in, the, in that time period, I lost my, 
passion for waking up. <laughs> I, I lost my desire. And so what, what became broken in my life was my sleeping patterns. And I, I shared with my staff a few weeks ago, oh, I, my sleeping habits must be restored because it's so out of whack. It's so broken. And, b- and by the way, the, the twins no longer wake up at night. They're no longer hungry every two hours. And wouldn't you know it, they would be hungry um, in staggered time periods. So it would be more like every hour we would wake up. Like, why can't you be hungry at the same time? But I don't have that excuse anymore. And so I shared with my staff, pray for me. Keep me accountable. I want to get back into the habit of rising early in the morning to pray, to sing praises, to exercise, to develop good habits. Oftentimes, what's broken in our lives are habits in need of repair. But I expand that question to our congregation. What is broken in our church and in need of repair? Last week, I jokingly said that this question is the question that our board of trustees has been entrusted with. And to a degree, yes, because they are entrusted to care for and ensure that our campus, our beautiful sanctuary, our property is in good condition for the mission and ministry of AUMC. But that's only one element. What else in our church it needs to be addressed, needs repair, needs God's mending hands? That is a critical question, and I believe all of us are invited to ask that question. And then there is a third question that I want to ask as I close today's message. What's on your pray list? That question is a play on words. Uh, These days, um, it it may not be something some of us are familiar with, but these days, uh, young people will ask each other, what's on your playlist? Meaning, what music are you listening to these days? Right? What's on your MP3 player, your Spotify, your iTunes, your phone? that you are listening to on repeat these days. But rather than a musical playlist, my question is this, what is on your pray list? What are you praying for these days? What are the ways in which you are recounting the promises of God back to the Lord, waiting for fulfillment, but you find yourself in this space of preparation? Brothers and sisters, may each of us come to grow in our faith as we bring before God our prayer list, as we pray through our greater work. Let us pray. Thank you, God, that you have taught us the importance of prayer. And thank you, God, that you have given us inspiration through Nehemiah and his prayers. And we pray for the same endurance that Nehemiah held. He prayed for a good five to seven months at least before he came up with this wild and outlandish idea that he himself would be the leader to restore the walls of Jerusalem and the faith of his people. And so that's our prayer, that you would give us inspiration to pray through whatever it is that's on our prayer list and that we would cultivate an endurance whether it takes five days, five months, five years uh, that we would prove ourselves faithful as we lean on you. God, we thank you and we love you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.